to make sure that we are able to complete and do a comprehensive study of the central nervous system there are various ways to approach the cns these are the important ways that i have come across one is the pathology based approach the etiology based approach and the approach that is based on the anatomical axis the pathology based approach is the one that hinders on what is the pathology behind the disease for example we have got ion transmission and channelopathies which has the epilepsy syndromes the migraine syndrome the periodic paralysis etc the neurotransmitter imbalance syndromes which are related to imbalance in the acetylcholine or imbalance in the gaba which manifest in various ways as alzheimers parkinsonism myasthenia gravis so on the gene transcription defects the degenerative hypoxic injury infection and inflammation are the important approaches the next approach is the etiology based approach which is infective vascular traumatic drug and toxin induced degenerative neoplastic and miscellaneous however i prefer the anatomical axis based approach because according to me this is the most methodical and organized approach to study the central nervous system it is also easy to remember and recollect because it is almost impossible to memorize all the pathology that is related to the cns if we go about in a unorganized manner like to summarize the approach the central nervous system as you can see is grossly divided into the pyramidal system and the extra pyramidal system the pyramidal system is the main system the extra pyramidal system also called as the accessory system which com- consists of the basal ganglia complex the pyramidal system is further subdivided into upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron the upper motor neuron part consists of the cortex the subcortex internal capsule brain stem and the spinal cord the lower motor neuron starts from the anterior horn cell going to the root and the radical to the plexus the peripheral nerve neuromuscular junction and the muscle we are going to discuss each of the levels anatomical levels and how they are going to have an impact on the signs and symptoms of the disease we have to understand that the main part in the cns is to anatomically localize the lesion hence we are going to discuss in short the signs and symptoms which are pathognomic of a particular anatomical level we'll start with the highest level that is the cortex the cortex is mainly involved in doing the cognitive functions and the speech functions the language functions and the complex motor activities hence the some symptoms and signs related to the cortex are sensorium convulsion aphasias memory and calculation impairment apraxias homonymous hemianopia and cortical sensation loss point towards a cortical involvement the subcortex was thought to be almost a dead place where nothing much used to happen but however it has been brought into vogue by hiv related progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and the dementia syndromes however there is nothing specific which is pathognomic of the subcortical lesions the third level is the internal capsule as we are all aware of in our mbbs days each case presentation that we have all done of hemiparesis definitely has got a case of hemiplegia which is related to internal capsule lesions it basically manifests as a complete hemiplegia dense hemiplegia so what is a complete hemiplegia and what is incomplete hemiplegia complete hemiplegia is the hemiplegia which is involvement of same side of the body and same side upper motor neuron facial on the same side of the hemiplegia is called as a complete hemiplegia incomplete hemiplegia when the upper motor neuron facial is spared on the side of the hemiplegia as we are all familiar with internal capsule is a place where the pyramidal fibers are packed together hence a small lesion also produces a big neurological deficit the next level is the brain stem which we are all familiar with which is composing of the midbrain the pons and the medulla the most pathognomic of brain stem syndromes is the crossed hemiparesis which suggests that cranial nerve involvement happens on the ipsilateral side of the brain stem lesion and the hemiparesis happens on the contralateral side due to the crossing of the pyramidal fibers 
Another important thing to note is that the brainstem is supplied by the posterior cerebral artery territory while the other the cortex of course has a supply from both anterior, middle and posterior cerebral artery circulation. Various syndromes which we definitely have to remember which are related to the brainstem. Before we go on to them, let us just revisit the brainstem circulation in short. This is just to tell you that there is here is the origin of the vertebral artery which is a direct branch from the aorta. Then it continues further joins together from both sides to form the basilar artery, gives the anterior and posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Then it goes on to join the circle of villis. From the center there is the distal part of the internal carotid artery which gives rise to the middle cerebral artery which eventually supplies major part of the brain through the lenticulostriate branches. They are further communicating with the anterior communicating artery and the anterior cerebral artery. Now we are concentrating on the brainstem part. Hence, these are the four levels as shown in the diagram. A and B correspond to the brainstem syndromes that is the midbrain syndromes. C corresponds to the pontine syndrome and D to the medullary syndromes. Let us start with each of them. What is important in our MCQs is to know which cranial nerve is involved and what are the clinical manifestations of that particular syndrome. Remember, though it is sounding complex, it is quite simplified and an important way to score marks in the CET. Starting with the midbrain syndromes, you have to remember, always connect, try to connect the origin of the cranial nerves from that particular level and that will help you localize the lesion to that particular level. Starting with the first syndrome, we have got Weber syndrome. The site of course along with the midbrain is the cerebral peduncle. Hence, the cranial nerve involved is the ipsilateral third nerve with contralateral hemiplegia. This is the most classical of brainstem syndrome, a crossed hemiplegia with ipsilateral third nerve and contralateral hemiplegia. Benedict syndrome involves the red nucleus and along with affection of ipsilateral third nerve presents as contralateral tremor, chorea and athertosis due to the red nucleus involvement. The Nagel syndrome involves the superior cerebellar peduncle and along with the ipsilateral third nerve presents as contralateral cerebellar ataxia. Clot syndrome is a combination of Benedict's and Nagel's, which involves the red nucleus plus the superior cerebellar peduncle. Hence, it manifests as ipsilateral third nerve palsy and contralateral tremor, chorea, athetosis and cerebellar ataxia. Going to the pontine syndromes,